well, let me welcome all of you to chat with Matt. Uh, the purpose of chat with Matt is to find people who have something interesting to say. And uh, our special guest tonight, uh, Debbie Fay, is uh, certainly one of those people. Uh, as I've said to her uh, and embarrassed her, she's one of the few people who has said things at our meeting uh, that I actually use every day. So thank you, Debbie. Uh, Debbie uh, lives uh, locally to where I am, and uh, she has presented at the Westport chapter uh, e every year that she's been in business. Uh, I'm very pleased to say she auditioned for business at one of our chapter meetings, so we can take pride in knowing her before she was famous. Uh, Debbie's, uh, I'm going to let, I always let my guest speakers uh, do a little intro about themselves. I've been introduced many times, and uh, whoever introduces me always manages to butcher it a bit. Uh, so I always let my speakers uh, uh, do their own 90 second announcement uh, and tell us a little bit about their journey before we get started. So uh, people understand where you come from. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm gonna spotlight uh, Debbie Fay, and I'll be jumping in and out here because uh, I'm also spotlighted and uh, we'll begin our conversation. Thank you. Debbie, Thank you. Uh, welcome to chat with Matt again. Here's, uh, this is the second time Debbie's honored us with her presence. Uh, the first time was at the very beginning of chat with Matt, so just as I helped her kind of kick off her uh, career, uh, she's helped me kick off chat with Matt by uh, coming to uh, presenting at one of, uh, or having a conversation with me at my meeting. So uh, uh, let me just mention how famous Debbie is. She's actually written a book called Nail It. It's not very thick, so you can get through it pretty quickly. Uh, and it is a book that was written pre-COVID, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So uh, without any further ado, Debbie, would you uh, share with us uh, how you got to where you are? Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to be here with all of you. And I've known Matt now for almost 15 years. I started my business in 2006, I didn't go live with it until 2007. And I met Matt, I believe in 2007. My yeah. background is in uh, corporate education. I used to be a trainer for various big companies. I also was a teacher at a business school for the better part of five years. And I had a, a lifelong involvement with theater. I was involved in theater from the time I could walk and talk. So those are the things that, that brought me to my business, uh, which is presentations, consulting, one-on-one -on -one coaching and training it was a dream of mine for probably a decade before I started my business. I love getting people on stage to deliver their messages, to successfully deliver their messages in their unique voices and be heard and get the results they seek. And that's what I've been doing. It'll be 15 years this August. Yeah. And I've not gotten tired of it one bit. No, that's it's great. Every day. Uh, Deb Debbie and I have this joke about um, uh, the people who put up the slide and they start with, I know none of you at the back of the room are going to be able to read this one. Right. They forget to mention that the people at the front of the room can't read it either. Right. You can't really see this, but yeah. Right. But I uh, need it as a, yeah. as a visual aid, so I'll remember what I was going to tell you. That's right. Right. Got it. So start us off. Let, let's talk about this. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you know, the whole world of PowerPoint kind of blew up a bit uh, after COVID and Zoom. Uh, Zoom uh, honestly hasn't, uh, they've come along a little bit. Uh, you can now do this double spotlighting thing. So you and I are swapping depending on who's talking. So that's very nice, but I can't do the CNN thing where there are two or three people on the box, in the boxes at the same time. I guess it's like the uh, the Muppets, the Muppet show where uh. everybody's in the, the windows. You can't do that yet, but I'm sure soon. But, uh, you know, let's start out with uh, how your practice has changed with the uh, PowerPoint presentations, as you and I discussed uh, in our first conversation, uh, when you were doing a PowerPoint presentation, you were in the room and you were really the star and people were looking at you uh, perf uh, and go back to your performing thing. Uh, that was really the show and the slides were 
a side thing. Yeah, I think, so I, I, I want to caution us about one thing, and that is I have a theater background, but a presentation is not a performance. It's a communication. And that's critical okay. because many people are, are fearful speakers and think they're bad speakers because they don't see themselves as performers. You're not supposed to be a performer in a, in a business presentation. The idea, the goal is to get your message across to the intended audience. And often our goal in a business presentation is to persuade our audience in some way. We want them to act differently right. or think differently um, or buy what we're selling. And, and by buy what we're selling, I'm, I'm talking about that in the big sense. So, yes. so your FANG members, it can be a presentation to a board of directors or to an executive team to adopt an initiative. It may be that the budget has run away on them and you are in front of your executive team and you need to convince them that a budget is there for a reason. And, and here are the places where <laughs> people aren't adhering to it. And here's sure. what's gonna happen if that continues. So yeah, we're, we're in very challenging times. Uh, yes, I yes. honestly don't know how they're gonna put Humpty Dumpty back together again. There are whole industries that have uh, uh, been on the ropes. So even the theater industry will bring that back. Oh, again. totally, totally. Yes, there are industries. The, the there cruise are ship industry. Right. There, there, there are I mean, wow. issues that have been hit very, very hard by the pandemic. And there are others that either haven't been hit hard or, in fact, are thriving through the pandemic. So sure. Amazon. Yeah, for one great example. Exactly. So so when we think about presenting in in this way, in, in mm -hmm. a virtual way, Matt is absolutely right that before when you were presenting live and in person, you were the, the main attraction, whether you liked it or not. The truth is humans love to see another human live and in person. That's a much more dynamic, engaging platform than this remote platform where we all currently find ourselves. Having sure. said that, having said that, particularly in a business setting, if you are speaking to the interests and, and, the, and the needs and the challenges of your audience in their language, mm -hmm. that will be compelling. That will be engaging. So that's where you wanna start. And, and, and I would urge you to start there regardless of whether you are on a remote platform or we're at the other end of the pandemic and you're presenting live and in person again, the, the first thing you want to keep in mind is, and my bespeakism for this is to turn your focus 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. I, I have worked with lots of financial professionals, CFOs, um, controllers, et cetera. And, and, those people have the company's absolute best interest in mind and at heart. Yes. And where I see presentations fall down is that, and, and many of us are guilty of this, by the way, not just financial professionals, where CFOs can fall down in their presenting is that they are so imbued with the importance of their message that they haven't put enough thought into their audience's viewpoint, into how much your audience knows about things like EBITDA, I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, and, and, and how really not familiar people in your audience, your executive team, members of your executive team are not as um, proficient in even Excel as you all are. And, and they may not even be able to immediately see a great visual like a line chart or a column chart or a stack chart, a stack column, and immediately be able to see what your message is. 
So, so the very first thing I would urge you all to do, if you want to be giving successful presentations, and I don't think you'd be here right now if, if you didn't want to be doing that, is particularly during this time of COVID when we're presenting remotely, when it is more challenging for your audience to get your message, is as you think about the message that you want to give, really, really, really first, put yourself in their seat. And, and if you're speaking to the executive team, put yourself into each person's seat. Put yourself in the CEO's seat, in the president's seat, in the COOs, in the CMOs, in the CHROs, each one of those people and think to yourself, okay, now I'm the CHRO, I'm Mary. How's Mary going to take this? What's Mary worried about? What's Mary not worried about that actually I need her to be worried about? Let me now think about putting myself in my CMO seat. What is he or she thinking about? What, how much does he or she you know, really is savvy about this kind of financial stuff? And then once you've done that, with all of those people in mind, now you start building your presentation. You know, so One of the things that I've always... Uh, thought was important for a CFO was to be able to explain difficult concepts to all of those audiences, because that is the job. They may not be able to do those things, but they need to understand them because financial measurements are how we're all measured, whether we're financial people or not. Exactly. I could not agree more. And here's the thing. If you can explain a difficult financial concept in a way that, as I always say, an eight-year-old or an 88-year-old can understand, your audience is going to love you because those people, those professionals ha have probably been sitting in meetings possibly for decades. And when the CFO starts talking, they are lost yep. and, and being lost, by the way, makes the lost person feel stupid and feeling stupid feels really bad. Yeah. And I, I was in a budget meeting and uh, one, one of the uh, top people uh, we were presenting to our, our management, uh, one of the top people asked the question that was financial in nature and be. I was just about to answer it, and one of my publishers answered it correctly. Oh. I was so proud. Yeah. I had explained the concept so well that they understood it. That's amazing. And what you and so what you want to be able to do, and if you can't do it, because I always say God doesn't give anybody everything. I'm I love presenting, I love building presentations. That's my zone. That's my jam, yep. as the kids would say financial stuff uh, it's like when the cable goes out on the tv you start talking about financial stuff and i just hear not so much any, <laughs> not so much anymore because i've helped a bunch of financial people now so i do know my way around this stuff a little bit okay. but i still need help i still need help so so if if you have trouble figuring out a concept i remember when um when the the uh, the Great Recession hit, and Ben and Jerry, the guy that the guys that own Ben and Jerry's ice cream, had a video on YouTube that explained the financial crisis, and they used Oreos, Oreo cookies, yeah. to explain it. And you could probably still find it if you Google, you know, do some Googling. It was genius. So that's what I'm talking about, about taking a difficult concept and making it understandable. It, right, so, so, so just to recap for everybody, many of the ideas that you've presented in your book, Nail It, are still very relevant. Oh, sure, sure. So Just because so, we're not really focusing on PowerPoint as much, the concept behind what we need to do to communicate uh, our ideas haven't changed. No, but I, so let me talk for a minute about what has changed because I, if this is why yes, you're please. here to, to, to hear about speaking during this time of the pandemic, I absolutely want to address that. I'm still using slides all the time. 
And it behooves you now in this time of the pandemic to have slides that are truly visual aids for your audience. And what I mean by that is they must be images. They can, and, and for financial people, this is awesome because they can absolutely be bar charts, pie charts, line charts, column charts. Th those are visuals. And what yep. you want to do is put those up with the labels in, in a, don't, please don't put the labels up with a seven point font. Let it be an, a, a 16 or 18 point font that is easily seen. Do not put the seven point lines of text underneath your line chart. That's what you're there for. You're there to explain what it is they are looking at. And I want you to give them these things. A you bite probably want to time. limit it to five, five footnotes. I'm zero. Yeah. Zero footnotes. Because that's zero. another thing people used to do on PowerPoint. They, they had to annotate everything. And, oh. you know, yeah. You no, no. Th that's why you're there. You're there to explain to your audience what they're looking at. And by yeah. the way, in a meeting to a board of directors or an executive team, uh, you really look like the expert if you can explain to them what they're looking at so that they can understand it and you don't have all that text underneath it. So, so for example, let me give you a for instance. Let's say you're going to present to them um, your, uh, the revenue and you're going to do it. It's the, you want to do a year over year. You want to show them five years. It's a line chart. Great, great visual please do not show them all five years at once. When you click and that's what they're looking at, it looks like spaghetti. And they're trying to look at the, at the key, right? To right. see which year is which, and it's very difficult. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to animate it and have it build one year at a time because there's a story behind every one of those years and why that revenue looked the way it did. So, so that's one thing. And, and it's even more important to do it that way remotely because people have a harder time following it. And so you wanna, you wanna take every precaution that you're not gonna lose anybody. That's why we use animation. Mm -hmm. That's why we click and talk about what they're looking at and then we click and explain what they're now looking at. A couple other things, Matt, um, yeah, as far as remote presentations, I want you to keep in mind. I would very much like you when you're presenting remotely to stand when you are presenting. I'm sitting right now because, and this is my office that I'm sitting in because I'm not presenting. I'm chatting with Matt. We're having a conversation. It'd be weird if I was standing while we were having a conversation and Matt's sitting, the two of us are sitting. When I present, I have a Zoom studio that's actually in my kitchen and I stand and present. And, and I would urge you to do that as well. I put my laptop on my kitchen counter and then it's, it's on boxes that elevate it so that, so that this is another important thing to be doing with Zoom or any platform, WebEx, I don't care what it is. You want your camera to be at eye level and you want to be looking at the camera while you are speaking and this is hard to do i'm dying to be looking at matt right now but i'm not i'm looking at my camera now when no. matt talks i look at matt but when i am talking and when you're presenting you need to be looking at the camera and it should be at eye level so you've got to prop your laptop up um, the other thing you want to be doing particularly because we are remote you want to be getting to the point quickly. Gone are the days when you can have three introductions, when you're kind of beating around the bush for five minutes before you get into the body of your presentation, before you get to the part that your audience is there for. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to do that. You want to have a very short introduction and you want to get right into what you're there for, what they came to hear, which I have to say, Matt, I imagine with this audience, you all are probably much more likely to get to the point more quickly because, you know, you're serious people. Yeah. 
Well, I think I think it's true that you know when we had physical meetings, it you had to allow ten minutes for everybody to just settle down. Oh yeah, that's true too. That's a really good point. And these and now days, people are uh, joining a meeting at exactly the bewitching hour, and they're there. Yeah, if you well, yeah, hopefully if you yours are because because you did a really smart thing, because you say on the invitation I start my meetings on time, so. For those of you that are working in an organization where people do dawdle in late, the best way to get them not to do that for your presentations is for you to start on time yeah. or as close to on time as you possibly can. And believe me, people will get the idea that when you call a meeting, you're starting on time. Maybe, maybe you're starting two minutes late. But you know, I think that's what you have to do. You know, this whole thing with uh, arriving stylishly late is, is not good for Zoom. In fact, I would encourage everyone to show up a few minutes early to any scheduled Zoom appointments. Sometimes there are technological issues. Uh, I've had to click a link twice. Uh, and you, you don't want to be late because people are starting meetings or should on time. Oh, and start especially late punishes the people who bothered to show up on time. That's right. That's right. That's right. Fair. Right, exactly. And by the way, if you're the speaker, and I, my guess is you're already doing this, so I, I want to be super clear. I, I don't. Please do not take anything I'm saying that you're already doing as me being condescending. Um, I'm still in Zoom meetings where people don't know some of this stuff, which is why I'm bringing it up. That in no way means I think you all are. Are, are not doing the things that I'm suggesting. And, and one of the things I'm about to suggest is, which I bet you're doing, is if you're the speaker, you want to get to the meeting, I would recommend you get there 15 minutes early. I always, and, and, and that will help you on the other side of the pandemic, because I'd like you to get to your live and in-person meetings where you are the speaker at least 15 minutes early. I'd like you to, even if it's a meeting with your own executive team, get in the conference room, hook up your laptop, put your slide deck up on the screen, click a couple times to make sure that it's working, pick the seat that you're going to sit in before you start speaking when you're going to stand next to your screen. And, and, and let me talk a minute more about why I want you to stand and present. I want you to stand and present for two reasons. Number one, because when you stand, you have the f advantage of your full energy, because when we sit, we lose half our energy. Number two, when you stand and present, you're way more likely to be speaking from your diaphragm, which is from where you want to be speaking. Uh, and number three, when you stand and present in a live in-person meeting, you most likely will be standing next to the screen, if it's at all possible. When you stand to the left of your screen, which is where I'd like you to stand because we read left to right, your audience will look at you and look at the screen, look at you and look at the screen. And that's what we want to have happen. If you sit at the conference table and you, the screen is up on the wall, you inadvertently cause something known as split, the split attention effect. And, and that's not a good thing. The split attention effect it's is when the audience good. doesn't know where to look. Should they be looking at you at the conference table or should they be looking at the slides? And, yeah. and, and by the way, at a conference table that's full, the people on this side of the table with you can't look at you. So that's not good. You want to be standing where you can be seen and, by the way, where you can be directing your audience for the really important stuff. Mm -hmm. You can be gesturing to the really important part of your presentation. Now, in a, in a, in a remote presentation, there are ways to be sure that your audience is looking at what you want them to be looking at on your slide. On, on the screen. Um, one of the ways is via animation, but there's another way too. So if you're showing an Excel part of an Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. and there's one particular row or even cell that you want them to be focused on, what I recommend that you do is create a circle 
or a square in a different color than, than what your Excel spreadsheet is and click and have that animate, have that come right to the cell or the row or the column where oh. you want their attention. Because the other thing we know about humans mm -hmm. is we notice inclusion, exclusion, and change. We notice when something appears, we notice when something disappears, and we know when something changes. So when you click and have that box around that cell, you mm -hmm. will be confident that everybody is looking right where you want them to be looking. Very important. So, you know, now, now that we're uh, working from home, we should really talk about how to look our best on uh, uh, when you're presenting. Yes. So there, there are a lot of people who, do, who are still not paying attention to their background and to their lighting. Perhaps you can talk to why that's so important. Yes. So I just want to say, I can't see everybody obviously in the gallery, but those I'm seeing in the gallery are very well lit, which is really important. You want light to be coming on your face and the more light on your face, the better. In my Zoom studio, um, I stand in front of a window and that is just, I just was able to do that. That's not always possible. Natural light is the best. Now, often I'm giving a presentation at night. I just spoke to the Cincinnati Fang Group last night, as a matter of fact. So it was dark outside when I was presenting. Yeah. Right. And so, so I have, um, I'm going to show you all and I want to be careful about it because I don't want to be like <laughs> breaking stuff. I have a, a ring light. So I ordered this on Amazon and now they're so prevalent. I was in um, Marshall's, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago and, and in, <laughs> in, the, in the, um, the, the line before you get to the cashier, they had ring lights that you clip uh, on the back of your laptop. So oh. it, yeah, they're everywhere now. This is how yeah. ubiquitous they are. I got this one on Amazon. So you can get them on Amazon. If you, if you cannot be well enough lit from your face, what you don't want to do is to be backlit, to be have the light coming from in back of you. And and actually, at the beginning of this 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 afternoon, um, Peggy and Matt and I were talking together. And because of the way the lighting is right now, I have a window. I'll show you. I have a window right here, and that's producing a lot of bright light. And so they suggested, I didn't realize how bright it was because often as, as, as the person sitting in the room, you're not really sure exactly how it's looking to your audience. I just turned my laptop so that is not creating any backlighting for me. So you want lighting coming from the front of you. Um, as far as your background goes, I am not a fan of the, of the virtual backgrounds. And I'm I- I'm not would, either. I, I was on a Zoom call just before this and someone was using a relatively, either they had a very good virtual background or uh, they had a computer that was refreshing fast enough, but it's still, you know, the, the, the distance between your glasses peeks through, people are wearing headphones and between the headphones, it looks plain goofy. Yeah. I and it, it, well, and, and if you move too fast, especially your head, suddenly you're only seeing right. half your head and, and you can be seeing either your real background. It's not necessary. It really isn't necessary because the only thing your background needs to be is not distracting and not messy. Even if your background is just a white wall, if that's really the best you can do, then just be sure that you're not wearing a white shirt. You should really actually be wearing a dark shirt or a dark jacket, a dark sweater. I took a lot of time, by the way, to set up this Zoom room in my office. My, you, the way I usually sit in my office is not like this. Now it is because I'm on Zoom so much. So I, right. I figure I took some time to figure this out and that may be what has to happen for you all, but I just wouldn't stress about it a whole lot. I, I really wouldn't. If yeah. you have um, a, a painting that you can put up behind you or you have a tree, like a ficus tree, you know, that's, that would sit next to you to provide some greenery, that could be nice. 
but it is not something to stress about. Don't forget the most important part of your presentation is not even you. It's your message. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a compelling message that is uh, directly relates to your audience needs and goals and problems, that's what this is about. It, it, that's yeah. the most important thing. So and, and I, I, I don't want people about, stressing. Uh, pardon me? Humans, uh, to your point of earlier about people detecting movement, you don't want anything in your background that is moving. Yeah, well. For example, if you have a clock with a, a, a oh. pendulum, not a good idea. Because people right. will start watching. Like fan. Oh, or a ceiling fan. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Th that's a good. So you want to be mindful of that. People are forgiving. We're all forgiving. We all understand that we're, we're in our homes. We are still in our homes. Oh, by the way, I want, I did want to mention there's an awesome um, website. It's I, I have, I am on Twitter and, and it's on Twitter as room rater, room rater like zoom room radar r-a-t-e-r -E it used to be rate my skype room and they got a new twitter <laughs> handle because nobody's on skype and right. i love it they i think they're canadian actually and they rate um people that we see on tv they rate their skype rooms uh, you can get a zero out of ten and people that are getting tens are so excited that they will retweet <laughs> the score. You know, just got a 10 out of 10 from Room Raider, made my day. Oh, okay. I, I do have to pre-qualify this by warning you that they definitely have a political sensibility. And so, you, you know, some, I don't know, we're not discussing politics ever in right. a presentation, unless you're a politician. Uh, so I am not, I'm not, weighing in one way or another what i am telling you is that you that you will see that they do have that um predilection having said that they still are are really rating skype rooms and so you can learn a lot by looking at how they're rating rooms at, at what sure. they and 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 listen i've seen several people on television that got a 10 out of 10 that were in uh, their kitchens. Um, so it's, it's interesting. It'll be interesting for you all if you're interested to see how they rate these Skype rooms. And, and I'll tell you something, you can have the greatest stuff behind you in the world. And if your camera is way up here, and so you're looking up like this, or way more likely your camera is way down here, you are going to get points knocked off. They're going to knock points off for you doing that. Sure. Sure. And there's nothing worse than having points taken off, I tell you. Right. All heck of break loose. You right. don't want that. Right. So, you know, we're, if you're, you're still doing PowerPoint slides, I gather, and uh, is there some change in the limit you would suggest for how many slides you might have? I, ne I never have a limit for slides. It depends on what your subject is. Mm -hmm. It's all driven by the message. What I have found for my own presentations and those I'm building for clients is I am giving them more visual cues. So I am, I am tending to put more images, images, not more words, more images in my presentation. So I don't even know if that would be necessary for you all presenting financial information. I would strongly urge you to animate it whenever possible, to give it to them a bite at a time, as I was saying before. Mm -hmm. Words, content is, is, is going to actually prevent them, not, not words, not in labels, but sentences, Mm -hmm. on your slides are actually going to prevent your audience from hearing your message because we cannot read and listen at the same time. When we right. read, actually our inner voice is reading it to our inner ear. Mm -hmm. So when you put something on your screen that requires your audience to read and you're talking to them at the same time, you're causing cognitive uh, overload. 
And mm -hmm. cognitive overload is as bad as it sounds. Cognitive overload is when you are short circuiting your audience's working memory. They cannot read and listen at the same time. Sure. It, it's like if any of you have children, when two of your children are talking to you at the same time, what do you say to them? Stop. I can't listen to two people at the same time. I'm we, developing some skills along those lines, but they're not well developed yet. Oh, you, 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 you can't. It's impossible. You just you really can't, can't do it. So there's, there's also the myth of multitasking, which is not really exactly. Correct. And you cannot multitask either. You can't. It, what you're really doing is called switch tasking. And, and, there's a, and there is a cost to switch tasking. There's a cost in the, um, in, in the cognitive ability, there's a cost in errors, and there's a cost in time because switch tasking, either milliseconds go by depending on the difficulty of the two tasks between which you're switching. So, and the other thing to, that you should know about visuals is if you, have visuals that are truly images, bar charts, line charts, pie charts, graphs. I mm -hmm. use, I love icons. So you have an icon with a label under it. You're labeling the icon. When you use those, you double your, more than double your audience's retention. Mm -hmm. Because when you use images coupled with your narrative, Mm -hmm. You are then using these two processors in working memory the way nature intended them to be used. And, and when you're, you're, your audience is able to look at the images and listen to you explain what they're looking at, you get yep. something that's called dual coding. And dual coding is what those two processors were meant to do. One was meant to process images and the other was meant to process language. Right. So especially no presentation would be complete without a discussion of the magic rule of three. Oh yeah. Okay. So and, right. And everyone probably didn't notice, but you did that earlier in this talk. Yeah, I do it. I, it's, I, I do it a and lot. So natural with you now. Yeah. So, so the magic well, rule of threes. Let's talk about the magic rule of threes. The magic rule of threes, for those of you who've never heard of it before, not to worry, is the, simply the idea that human beings love threes. Human beings love to organize thoughts in threes. And I'll give you a bunch of examples: um, past, present, and future. Stop, yield, and go. Here, there, and everywhere problem, solution, result. The genie grants you three wishes, Goldilocks and the three bears, the three blind mice, the three little pigs, Larry, Moe and Curly, three strikes and you're out. I, I, I could go on and on. And now that I've brought this up, yes, you're gonna notice threes everywhere for the next couple of days. It's because I've brought it to, your, to the forefront of your attention. Most you, importantly bet, for financial people who think in tens, it's important to make the, the branch to thinking in threes and talking about things in threes. You know, the 10 major reasons why we should do this. No, not 10, three. Or, or, or you could have, when it's reasons to do something, when you're talking about benefits of doing something, then you can have five. And this is not a Debbie Faye thing. This is a sales best practice is five benefits to any product or service or idea that you want to promote. Why? Because your audience will take away three. No more than five, because what we know from research is that really people can only hold, most people can only hold five ideas in their head. So more than that is, is diminishing returns. And I used to do this visual with, with balls where I would have somebody hand me bouncy balls. And once they got to five, when they tried to give me six, I would dump all of them because that's what happens. When you push your audience to try and remember beyond five, 
they give up. Yep, and you can't, I, get, you, I can't remember the beginning of the thread. The rule of threes. Oh, yeah. oh when they give up. Oh, right? when, they, when they come yeah, to they're six, done. I'm, they're I'm done. Not. They're done. So, so, but organizing your presentation, you should do in threes. And I bet you're already doing it because for those of you who work for an organization, I'll bet you any amount of money that when you give an update, it's something like, here's where we were last quarter. Here's where we are now. And here's where I see us going for next quarter. Three. Those yeah. are th three buckets of information. We have a star in the audience, Don Minges, who has spoken to our group before, and uh, he had something, I hope, brief to say. It is, Don. Matt. <clears throat> Matt, I really appreciate this because her point is so perfect. When we meet people who are looking for a job, they tell, I can do any industry, any job, anywhere, any size. I can't remember that. Uh, so I want to stop with that and let you go. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. So you, you could, you could, and, and I love that. That's great. In fact, I, um, pre COVID, I haven't done it post, I haven't done it in COVID, but pre COVID, I did a lot of, uh, interview workshops and I would start one of the first exercises was because a opening softball question is always tell me something about yourself. And so I would have my attendees write down three adjectives or short phrases about themselves. And then later on in the workshop, I would ask them to think of a story that they could tell to prove one of those adjectives about themselves. And guess what? A successful story has three parts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in there's that three again. Right. And a successful business story has three parts. Here was the problem or goal. Here's what I did to attempt to solve that problem or achieve that goal. Part two and part three, what the result was of my solution. Yeah. You know, what people don't quite realize is that uh, when you tell a story like that and people can remember it, they use it as a way to introduce you to the next person you should meet. I met Matt and he said, A, B, C. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Stories are so sticky. And, and that's why yeah. you're, you should also, by the way, in your persuasive presentations, this is for another conversation, mm -hmm. whether it's live in person or remote, when you all are trying to convince people to do something, your executive team, your board of directors, your own team, or the marketing team, or the HR team, whoever it is, your children, <laughs> you mm -hmm. need to have stories to back it up. You need to have stories that prove that what you're suggesting will work, will either achieve the goal or solve the problem. Okay, so we're getting to 15 minutes still, and uh, the chat box is open. Uh, my wife, Peggy, is, is acting as a uh, uh, supervisor uh, in this. And uh, if there's anything interesting in the chat box, she's going to interrupt us and chime in. So we or, can or any question questions. that you want to ask, please ask away. This is, I'm happy to. Yeah, the purpose happy. of this is a conversation. Uh, that's why we don't have death by PowerPoint. We're trying to have a conversation and stories that I hope you will remember without visual aids in this case. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit when you and I spoke about the fact that you're not in the room when you're doing uh, Zoom. I assume I believe there's other services that allow you to have your slides and you about the same size, but not yet on Zoom. Well, we were talking about you, you, you can achieve this when you share your screen. And I would urge you to do this within your own company or even if you're speaking to clients and, and it, you're a relatively small group because you can take the time in a small group for everybody to get it figured out. And, and by the way, I wanna, I wanna give credit to a Cleveland FANG member for this um, idea. 
you can actually, when you're sharing your screen, you can pull on the, the thumbnail of the speaker. If, if your audience is in speaker view, not gallery view, if they're in speaker view, they can then pull on the thumbnail of the speaker and make that bigger. It will make the slides smaller, but if you have slides that are just images, that's going to be okay. And then you, you, the speaker and your slides that you're sharing can be side by side. Yeah. Um, yeah, Debbie, there was a question that uh, somebody wanted to know. He said, if you are not presenting financial charts and graphs, can you give an example of what would be a good visual to present? Yes. Thank you for that great question. When I'm presenting, I'm not a financial professional, so my, my slides do not have charts and graphs in them, except one that I'm using as a demo for a before and after. So what I use are icons. And um, there's a great website, in fact, it, and I have a subscription to it. It's called The Noun Project, N-O-U-N, the opposite of verb, although they do have verbs. Uh, they're starting to get other, um, lots of other parts of speech and, and it's the noun project and you, it's, you go to the site and, and there's a big um, field box where you type in a word. So I would type in presenter and up come screens full of icons of presenters and, and because artists have contributed to this site and they get paid ideally you're supposed to attribute the art attribute sorry the artist if mm -hmm. you don't have a subscription i have a subscription so it always says to me no need to attribute your noun pro and i'm happy to pay the subscription because i use it all the time so i highly recommend icons to to um to represent a thing that you're talking about. I also love smart art that's, a, that's in PowerPoint. It's on your top, when you click on insert and you look across your top ribbon, one of the options is smart art and that will help you. You can put words into smart art. I would ask you to not put more than five at the max into one of those boxes or fields, but they have great um, smart art uh, processes. I love. So if, if you're talking about a process, they have different options. There are options for relationships. So you can put yourself in the middle and five things around. That's a great way to have visuals. Another one is I have um, done a lot of work helping the U.S. Fund for UNICEF. And when we build presentations, and this is probably I'm hoping would be obvious to you. We use photos. We it's 90% photos because UNICEF has the most amazing, amazing photographs of the world's children in need of, of UNICEF ambassadors and UNICEF employees helping the world's children. Um, we can also use photographs to illustrate the problems that are going on. So when I do a, a, a presentation, build a presentation for them, it's lots of photos. I oh. hope that that helps. More questions, Peggy? No, no, I don't. Nope, there's nothing. So with some, the uh, I, I love war stories. So what are some of the worst things that people have done mm. or worst things that people do? We talked so, a little bit about too many, uh, you know, the, the slides you can't read even from the front of the room. Yeah. So here's a thing people are doing on Zoom and WebEx and all that, that I would beg you all not to do. Please okay. do not read your presentation. You, you may be under the mistaken impression that if you write down what you want to say, that then it's going to come out perfectly. It, it could be perfect in writing, but if you read it, it's going to sound like reading. And reading is not engaging, it's not stimulating, it's not connecting. Reading sounds like reading. And it does not need to sound perfect. You'll notice, I I'm a presentations coach. I speak 
all the time to groups of people. By the way, a silver lining of COVID is that I have now spoken in the past year to more people than I've probably spoken to, well, not yet, but I've spoken to hundreds of, of people in the past year because you can get on a call, right? You can get on a Zoom call from anywhere on the planet. Okay, having said that, I speak, I stumble, I have a few ums and ahs, I repeat things unintentionally, I'll stop a sentence and then start it again. You guys don't care. It, it sounds, um, I just ummed, it sounds dynamic. It's, it's, it's live. Now, the one thing that I do that you have to do is practice your presentation out loud. I practice my presentations out oh, wow. loud wow. in slideshow, yeah. clicking and talking and clicking and talking. Yeah, and I think okay. even no matter how many presentations you do, if you're going to swap between your slides and you being on the screen, you really should practice that. Right. And uh, you, you have Zoom allows you to do that. You can even oh. re you can even record yourself and see how you do. You can, you can. Do you do that, by the way? Uh, I have, yes, I have. Um, see, if and, an expert and, says it's okay to do it, some of the people will do it. Yeah, no, you can totally record yourself. I, what I don't want you to okay. do is, is memorize what you're going to say. I don't, I, practicing is not the same as mm -hmm. memorizing. In fact, it should come out a little bit different every time. Well, I want you to practice no more than three or four times for a new presentation so that you are confident that you know what is going to happen as you click, you know what your transitions are, and you know what you're going to say. And you have said it, you practice saying it out loud. Sorry, Peggy, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to first re. I, I, well, I guess I'll add to that. And then there's a question. Um, practice and I, everything you said, I totally agree with. I, I do find that not reading, but sometimes because people are worried that they're going to get distracted or forget to create sort of an outline. And what I do personally is I create an outline with some key points uh, numbered and I have it so I can kind of look down. So I remember which way I'm going, especially if somebody is talking or if I, if, if a question's asked. So that's, that will help you feel that you have something to present. You know, something that's that's um, a crutch, if you want to call it that. Not a memorized, but you're not reading. You're just looking at something that helps you remember where you're going. Because your screen doesn't have any words on it. No, but if you practiced with your slides, just as your visuals will help the audience remember what you've said, your visuals as you practice will help you remember what your talking points are. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. I just find that yes, sometimes. That was question, Peggy? Yeah. Um, the question says many executive coaches and outplacement firms rely or recommend on SOAR to star stories as examples. And this violated the rule of three. What do you think? I don't know what that means. Are you familiar with SOAR to stories? No, it sounds like an acronym, S-O-A-R. Maybe the story has four parts to it. it I don't know. Um, Eileen, I think it was Eileen. You want to explain it? Uh, SOAR is situation uh, something, activity result, and STAR is situation task action result. It, it was SOAR or STAR. 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 I, you know what? I have no problem with that. I'm not so, I'm absolutely not so dogmatic that four parts to a story is going to bother me at all. And, and, and by the way, in fact, I think what they've done is, is, is um, dissect a story in more detail than what I was just proposing. So no, 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 that sounds great, Eileen. That sounds terrific. Thank you. Okay, that's it. There were no more questions. Okay. We're good. Yeah. W w one more thing I just wanted to say about what Peggy. We're not said. signing off yet. Oh, We're not good. Off that an, easy. Okay. About an outline is that yeah. if, if you want to have a few 
big important points that you know you don't want to forget, that's certainly fine to do. I give a, a, a motivational presentation that is called Why Not Me, Why Not Now? And in that presentation, I go through five famous people and what happened to them in their lives. And for one of those people, the details of her life are a little bit obscure and I haven't committed them to memory yet. And so what I did was I taped up on the frame of the window just to my right in a 16 point font, just a few key words and numbers actually that I can cheat and look up at and, and then look right back at my camera to, to tell everybody what those key points are. That's what I'm saying that yeah. I do. And yeah. I think that sometimes yeah, it's helpful. Right. And there's, you know, if you're doing PowerPoint slides and they're just images, uh, since we're in the world of Zoom, there's nothing wrong with having the slides with notes on your desk in front of you. No one can see them. No, no, no. Right. You just don't want to be looking down more no, than you're looking not. at the camera. But absolutely, that's fine. And by the way, particularly in, I know I keep referencing board meetings because I know that, that board meetings are a different animal, frankly. There's a, they're often that your presentation has to be said ahead of time. So it needs to be something that there is reading involved. I completely understand that. What, and, and often you, you there, there may be the opportunity, and if there is, I would urge you to take it, to, to send your board of directors or your executive team the slide deck that is verbose, that does have the small 11 point type with the explanation of the line chart or the bar yeah. chart or whatever it is. But if you can, and if you're literally going to be presenting to the group the next day or two days or three days later, what mm -hmm. I recommend you do is take out the written content and put it in speaker notes just to store it somewhere and blow up make bigger the line chart or bar chart. And then in the real live presentation, talk to what they're looking at, take the content away, only have the visuals and talk to it. And absolutely you can be, you can create reference notes for yourself that's cool. You don't want to be reading anything. You want to be really positioning yourself as the expert. It's your stuff. You're going to talk to it. You're no other funny right. stories, unless we have a question. You're absolutely right. I love that. And, and also when you, when you're talking to the story, you speak with more passion than when you're reading. Yeah. There's the there, reading is, is, no bueno. No, yeah. no, no, terrible. no terrible. Human yeah. beings, you know, from the time you're a small child, your grandmother's stories, the stories are what you remember. That's right. That's right. You Man, were going to tell a funny I, story? I assume we, we think in terms of stories, don't that's we? That's right. Yeah, that's right. You have to have a story. That's how people, uh, Abraham Lincoln would tell jokes and stories to, to make his point. Right. And I think that's right. what we need to do in this uh, world of Zoom as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and and it just even post Zoom, the the stories are what to your point, and and it, I know we're not talking about interviewing right now, but in interviewing, the stories that you tell that prove that you can do the thing that you said you could do to Matt's point exactly, are the things that your interviewer is going to remember, and not only will they remember it, they will retell the story to the next person you're yep. going to interview with. So a, a, stories a story are key. is memorable and it is a tool for people to introduce you to someone else. Yep. A good night, I, I, I tell people that when we used to meet in person, no one remembers that time, but there was a time. Uh, I would uh, tell people that uh, when I went to meetings uh, and I met, I saw people that I knew in a gathering of three to five people as I joined the group, my friends would often introduce me with my 90 second announcement. I didn't have to say a thing. I see. Yeah. They remembered my memorable 90 second announcement. Matt Butt, he finds chief financial officers and controllers for middle market companies done. 
Yeah. That I would be introduced. Yeah. I yeah. mean, how cool is that? And and to flip it, Matt, for those of you who are reluctant networkers, you don't you don't love going to a networking event where you're not going to know anybody. And I moved my whole life as a kid until ninth grade. And, and my sister and I, our whole lives were the new kid and we were always meeting people. So we love that. But here's our trick. Here's what we do. And we've probably done it since we were little girls. It, and we have a brother too. I don't want to leave him out, but he, we moved to Birmingham, Michigan when he was before he started kindergarten. So we moved three times in Birmingham, Michigan, but he never had to move states the way my sister and I did sure. <laughs> more than once. So anyway, an easy thing to do in a networking event is ask, go up to someone standing alone because they're probably feeling super uncomfortable and say to them, hi, is, is this your first time at this event? Really? Yeah, it's, well, it's my first time or it's my second time. What do you do? And ask them a question about themselves and they will talk and tell you about themselves. They'll start feeling more at ease. They will naturally at some point stop talking about themselves and say to you, so what do you do? And then before you know it, you're in a natural kind of conversation. Or as the joke goes, enough about you. Let me tell you about me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stop it. Okay, we're, we're way off the track now, but... Yeah, but, well, yeah. we go off the rails. That's why yeah. the beauty of a, uh, my having a conversation with you is we go off in different directions. Yeah. Pretty cool. So, All right, so, so we're at five o'clock. What, what did we miss? What, what, what have we not talked about, you think? I can't, I, I can't Any, think of... One last funny story would be nice. Uh, oh, gosh. I, I, oh, I'll, or we'll have you back and you can tell funny stories for an hour. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I'm trying to think if I've had a funny, oh, well, this is a funny story. I, I, when Zoom, when, when all the pandemic first started, yeah. uh, an organization that some of you may know called XPX, they, um, they, they sure. buy, they, finance companies and buy and facilitate buying and selling of companies, I believe they, they wanted me to come on and just talk for 30 minutes about presenting remotely, but they kept changing the date on me, which is fine. I get it. They had, they had really some pretty high profile people that they were able to get. So they kept moving me, pushing me a week, a week, a week. I said, fine, fine, fine. I had just been giving a pre wait, no, no. I was in a meeting with a client that morning and I was in my exercise clothes no makeup. And I just happened to, to see mail come up in my outlook. And it was an XPX mail that said today on our meeting, Debbie Faye, <laughs> and uh -huh. it was going to happen in 10 minutes. <laughs> and I was just a mess. I ran downstairs, threw a button down shirt on, grabbed my makeup, was throwing it on my face, brushing my hair, got into the Zoom room. Thank God they had three people that were presenting that day and two were before me. Ah, I'm telling okay. you, I just squeaked in there at the last second. It was just unbelievable. unbelievable. My heart rate, if I had had my fit bit on, my heart rate was probably through the ceiling. Well, at least you didn't have to drive there. Oh, well, that would have been impossible. Right. But, and at least during Zoom, you've had no lost luggage. I know you traveled a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, I miss traveling. Anyway, the last thing I want to say is that, that you can um, find me. Matt put all my links in his emails. Please, yes. if you didn't ask a question today for some reason, but you do have a question, please reach out to me via email. I'm happy to answer it. I'm also looking for opportunities to speak about how to give remote presentations and also about how to nail the remote interview. So if you are part of an organization that would like me to come speak or even your own business, happy to do that. So reach out to me and let's have a conversation about that. Yeah, and uh, we, 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 will, we have uh, our, our video resources tab created on our website and uh, Debbie's presentation will not be there immediately, but it will be there shortly. And all the people that you talk to from today on, you can tell them you should have been there for Debbie's presentation, but you can watch the reruns and you should. Thank and, you. Uh, Debbie will be thrilled to uh, uh, talk to anybody who has questions. 
uh, and she's always a delight. So thank Debbie, you. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And uh, in addition to starting my meetings on time, I try to end them on time too. So I want to thank all of you for joining me for a uh, chat with Matt. I'm going to stop Debbie for a minute uh, and uh, thank her for presenting to all of us. And uh, all of you, uh, if you can make a donation, you know, we, we live on voluntary donations in this networking group. It's not an easy way to live, uh, but that's how we do it all. So if any of you have a couple spare bucks, uh, the donate button is on uh, the middle of our uh, screen when you sign into our website, and I hope you will uh, donate what you can. That's all we ask of people. No, You don't have to make a college tuition payment. Well, you can save that for your kids. So thank you again, Debbie, for uh, joining us on Chat with Matt. And uh, we'll have, I have uh, actually, uh, I think at least, I think, think I have three more chats with Matt scheduled in the next few weeks. So I hope all of you will uh, join in. Debbie, again, thanks. And uh, we'll see you again on uh, Chat with Matt. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe.